Now, my talk today will explore the place of the Second World War in both the history and the memory of British Columbia and its residents. I'm still in the early stages of what is going to be a multi-year project exploring this topic, so I have some insights to offer, but I still also have much to learn. And I hope to lean on the members of this organization and uh, your host institutions over the years to come, as I said, about reconstructing British Columbians' war experiences in the home front. Now, if you'll humor me for a moment, I want to begin with a small exercise. You close your eyes and you think of the Second World War in relation to Canada and its national story. I think it conjures a multitude of images and memories. Canada's declaration of war, massive recruitment and marching off to war, the Battle of the Atlantic against the German U-boats, the strategic bombing campaigns over Germany, the ill-fated operations at Hong Kong and Dieppe, the internment and dispossession of Japanese Canadians, and the massive wartime economic boom that transformed Canada's economy a massive expansion in women's economic and social roles, the Italian campaign, D-Day, the conscription crisis, and finally VE Day, and much less importantly for Canadians, VJ Day. In fact, so much less important that I struggled to find an image to include in this slide. Followed by demobilization and the relative prosperity of the post-war years. Now, all of this is a story that I think Canadians are quite familiar with today. Much of it falls within the rosy, nostalgic framing of what the scholars have come to term the Good War, that collective memory of that conflict. Though, of course, that was not how the war was remembered until relatively recently. As Tim Cook shows in his book, The Fight for History, tracking the trajectory of Canada's memory in history about the Second World War. In the years after the war, the memory of the war was mostly left to veterans who mostly kept it amongst themselves. Aside from a few official histories and some scholarly and popular works that made their way into the market. Aside from a few official histories and a few scholarly and popular works, though, there wasn't very much produced on the Second World War, at least on Canada's experience of the Second World War. Uh, growing up in the 1970s and early 80s, as a young kid who was interested in military history, and in particular in Canada's military history, I can remember going to the bookstore, you know, in Cranbrook, the bookstore, and, and there being virtually nothing to, to buy on Canada's military history. There were works on military history. That was something that did have a popular audience. But these were all publications from the United States or Britain on the First and Second World Wars or military history more broadly. And there was virtually nothing to look at if you were interested in Canada's military history. It wasn't, I think, until Jay, what Jay Winter termed the memory boom of the 1990s and early 2000s that things actually began to change. Major collective acts of remembrance on the 50th and the 60th anniversaries of um, D-Day and VE Day in the 1990s and early 2000s uh, were, were really critical to this experience. In these years, we saw historical battlefield tours multiply. Canada's war even made it into beer commercials. The images on the left of Billy Bishop and Commonwealth War Graves were included in a Molson beer commercial that had a montage of Canadiana. Um, and there were other references that made it into beer commercials in the time period. And while well, I'll grant you it's not terribly scientific, perhaps I take, you know, being making it into beer commercials as a useful measure of pop cultural arrival. There was also, of course, the image on the right is from a famous and quite emotionally charged Bell commercial of a young backpacking Canadian group who phoned his grandfather from the beach at Dieppe to say thank you. What we saw then through the memory boom of the 1990s and 2000s was an elevation of veterans and their sacrifices and an overall intensification of interest in Canada's military past. And this is something I witnessed firsthand within my own classrooms as I was teaching Canadian military history. During these years, the writing of Canadian military history also expanded enormously, in particular on the world wars, 
with entire shelves of popular and academic histories available now in the Second World War alone. The change from the years of my youth is really quite profound. And these stories have come to form a really prominent role, I think, in Canadians' popular memory in how we envision our collective story. It's so much so that I would argue that that history is now intertwined with Canadian sense of collective identity. Now, I hope you'll pardon that somewhat lengthy discussion of the national memory. But now I'd like you to take off your national hat, if you will, close your eyes one, once again, and imagine the same conflict and its meaning to you as a British Columbian. It's not so easy, is it? If you were to draw up a list of prominent Second World War events in relation to your understanding of this province and of its identity, I bet the list would be much shorter. And in fact, you might even struggle to come up with much to add. Now, certainly there are stories of the war years that have left a mark on the collective memory of British Columbians. More than any other, it is, of course, the appalling treatment meted out to Japanese nationals and Japanese Canadian citizens in the wake of Japan's dramatic entry into the war in 1941 that stands over all else. More than 22,000 people of Japanese ancestry were rounded up, shipped east away from their homelands along the West Coast, and interned in camps in BC Southern Interior, on sugar beet farms in Southern Alberta, and as far away as Ontario. Their businesses, fishing boats, and homes were all seized and sold off. They were banned from returning to the Pacific Coast until years after the war, and thousands were expatriated to Japan, including many Canadian citizens who had never seen the place. Indeed, this shameful event stands so prominently that it's become the single BC story that we have contributed to the broader national memories of the war. And I would argue it is almost the only story that dents that otherwise good war image. Beyond the Japanese internment, however, I think it becomes more difficult to point to BC stories of the Second World War that remain part of the public memory of that conflict. People might have heard of the shelling of the Esteban Point Lighthouse by Japanese submarine I-25 or the terrorist conscript mutiny. But I think it's hard to point to any other stories that have developed a wider recognition across the province. Now, we might perhaps assume that some of the elements of the national story can be found here in more finite form, like women's shift into industrial and other non-traditional occupations. And that would be accurate, but I think it doesn't really grow from an exploration of British Columbians' war experiences so much as it comes from assuming that British Columbia was merely a small percentile of what was a national war effort. The upshot of this sort of extended introduction is, I think, to highlight that while we might assume the Second World War was an important event in British Columbia's history, it has not really found a prominent place in the broader memories of British Columbians, and it certainly doesn't occupy the same prominence as it does in relation to our national identity and, and, and memory. So what are we to make of this? Well, I went in search of the history of the war in BC, spending the, the bulk of a sabbatical reading hundreds of books, articles, graduate theses, and I expected that it might prove challenging. And in fact, it was very difficult initially to actually find any kind of sustained uh, or systematic analysis of the war years. I actually published an historiographical article this spring based on this reading in BC Studies under the title, An Occasional Distant Rumble of Guns, as I thought this phrase really captures the, the episodic, disjointed, often fleeting attention that British Columbia scholars have paid to the Second World War which has mostly appeared as a kind of distant and frankly not terribly important phenomenon. And yet the war demar commonly demarcated the divide between British Columbia's colonial and young provincial period on the one hand, and the launch of its kind of modern era during the WAC Bennett years between 52 and 72, with its mega projects and, and huge transportation and logistical infrastructure development. But the war was not the dividing point because it was selected as such. It was more out of an absence of mind. And so if you look more broadly at the literature published on BC in the, second, in the 20th century, it's really bifurcated. 
We have a rich and varied historiography covering the late 19th and the early 20th century up to 1939. And a still small but vibrant and rapidly growing literature on the years since 1945. But the war years themselves have become the divider kind of by default rather than out of a conscious choice. And I think part of the reason for that, for the relative lack of work on the war, arises out of uh, a coincidence in timing. The Canadian historical profession went through quite a profound change in the 1960s and 70s. As young scholars, tired of a history populated with dead white powerful men, went in search of the stories of women, ethnic minorities, working classes, and Indigenous peoples. The social history revolution, as it's known, would also see the rejection of what was perceived to be old-fashioned bad history, typically including political, economic, and of course, military history. Now, the coincidence was that this was also the time period when the academic history of BC would see profound growth through the 1980s and into the 1990s. From its few early practitioners into a thriving field in its own right. But those that were exploring BC's history in these years that followed were often products of that social history wave and primarily interested in Indigenous settler relations, social class, race, and gender, and the ways in which these factors shaped the historical experience of British Columbians. And they were explicitly not interested in the Second World War, except obliquely. And so the war languished in relative obscurity. Even in this obscurity, there still was some coverage of certain aspects of the war. The Japanese removal and internment obviously is some quite extensive and, and quite sophisticated research uh, and publications. Indeed, more publications on this topic than on all other work touching the war years combined. Beyond this, if you read through some of the surveys, histories of British Columbia, the academic and the popular, I think you get a pretty good sense of the dominant storylines. And in fact, there are three storylines that they all include. First, of course, the Japanese internment. Second, the political scene, the, the antics of Premier Duff Patello, uh, the rise of the CCF, and the coalition government that, uh, that ruled BC through much of the war years. And the third major storyline comes in the growth in strength, reach, and legitimacy of organized labor, particularly in forestry that was achieved during the war. Some will touch on some other touchstones of the war, socio and economic impact on job growth, for instance, uh, rising industrialization, and of course, women's roles. But often that material is, is more extrapolated from the national story. So the overall picture then, is relatively thin on details, and perhaps most strikingly, there is little sense of the broader impact of the conflict and how it's is situated in the long historical narrative of British Columbia. When you dig, though, you can unearth an eclectic range of works that touch on the war in a wide variety of ways and in different topics. On women and work, on the explosion of the shipbuilding industry, the province's evolving political culture, on Indigenous home front experiences, education and, and schooling, childcare debates and social policy, tourism, housing in Vancouver, labor relations, to name just some of the more prominent ones. And you can extract from these components of what are key building blocks for understanding British Columbia's wartime experience. There is also a military historiography of BC during the war. Much of it examining Pacific security and defense, uh, sort of coastal defenses, uh, BC regimental histories, Pacific Coast militia rangers, and fishermen's reserve. And while it's important, uh, and though often the military literature is closer to the war, somehow it often also feels more distant from British Columbians uh, and their lives. So, for example, the regimental histories of BC based units follow the enlistment in their communities as the war breaks out, but then they tend to track the regiment's travels overseas and through the fighting on the front lines in Europe 
What's left behind was the militia organization that each regiment maintained. And this is largely ignored in this literature, though these remain vibrant and important components in their community's wartime experience. Now, given the diversity and regionalism of British Columbia in the mid 20th century, I think one key approach must be local and community centered histories. Many parts of the province were still largely disconnected from each other when the Second World War broke out. Uh, disconnected physically, uh, but also intellectually. You still couldn't drive from the coast to the interior to the 1930s, and even then it was on gravel roads. And so British Columbians' collective sense of self was still quite poorly developed. And we remained very much divided, one valley from the next, the interior from the coast, the north from the south, the islands from the mainland. And so I, I suspect that British Columbians' experience of war was very much connected to and specific to place. And yet to date, we have only a single popular history of Nelson's experience of the Second World War, uh, that is a sort of standalone publication, and a single scholarly article on Fort St. John. Both of these are really important. Uh, both of them also, in some ways, a surprising reversal of the usual bias that we see towards the communities of the populous southwest of the province. This is an especially important place, I think, where, where local histories, where community historical and heritage institutions can be really crucial in trying to fill in some of the blank spaces with the richness of the stories that community members still retain. Stories that might be remembered in specific locales, but have not yet been shared more broadly across region or the province as a, at large. Part of the challenge, I think, in this in the past is, has been academic scholars, well, frankly, tepid enthusiasm, shall we say, for working with popular and community produced historical narratives. So a lot of these local stories have not found their way from the local histories in which they reside into broader synthesis of region and province and nation. On the whole then, the existing literature on BC history provides only a disjointed and disconnected collection of pieces for what is a very large and complex puzzle. Now, one might argue, I suppose, that if stories of the Second World War have not remained in the collective memories of British Columbians, or emerged in its histories, it may be because the war was not actually all that important to the province's history. Given I'm here to talk to you for a good best chunk of an hour, uh, I obviously would not answer this in the affirmative. In fact, I think there's all kinds of indications that the war affected the province and its residents in every region in a multiplicity of ways. For starters, over 90,000 British Columbian men and women served in the various branches of the military, plus another 15,000 the Pacific Coast Militia Rangers and 500 plus in the Fishermen's Reserve from a population that was only around 800,000 when the war broke out. That's much higher than the national average. Nationally, about 10% of the population served in the Second World War. In BC, we're talking about roughly one in seven that were directly engaged. That would suggest that this conflict mattered to them. We also know that at its peak, the British the Canadian military had more than 30,000 military personnel stationed along BC's coast in late 1942 into 43 as defense against a Japanese attack, as well as, of course, as to, to prove to the Americans that we we're holding up our part of the defense of the Pacific in order to protect our sovereignty from US infringements. In addition, of course, the story, the American need to defend Alaska and the construction of the Alaska Highway and other major wartime projects had a massive impact on BC's northern communities. Places like Dawson Creek and Fort St. John, as well as Prince Rupert, experienced the influx of thousands of US, Canadian military personnel, as well as civilian contractors that had, into what had formerly been relatively small and remote communities. The expansion of the communication and transportation links, as well as port facilities in Prince Rupert, brought in the outside world and transformed residents' lives. 
as well as in some cases the economic trajectories of these communities into the post-war. We also, of course, know that the onset of the Pacific War provoked a dramatic demographic shift with the population of Japanese descent ripped from the coastal regions and shipped inland or out of province and discouraged from returning after the war, forever altering the makeup of BC society. Their prominent place in the BC Pacific salmon fishing industry, largely filled by indigenous men and women, and in Fraser Valley farming, they were largely supplanted by Mennonites. Of course, it also brought the Pacific War in a different way into the lives of the residents of the quiet valleys of the Kootenays, where thousands of Japanese Canadians were interned during the war. If we knew nothing else, these would suggest that the war was a meaningful event that left a significant mark in the lives of British Columbians who lived through it all across the province. Beyond those kind of more trodden topics, if we were to try and extrapolate from the extensive national literature that we have on the Canadian home front, there are, I think, also many reasons to suggest that the war may have shifted political values to the left, disrupted gender norms and roles, increased the, large, the, state, the role of the state in people's lives, transformed economic realities and launched a consumer culture, massively accelerated industrialization and urbanization, initiated movement from an ethnically defined identity to a more civic value defined identity and generally strengthened feelings of nationalism. I could go on. But certainly if any of these profound wartime impacts made their presence felt in this province, we should be exploring this. And just as importantly, if these national impacts were not felt or were felt much differently here in British Columbia, then that too needs explanation. As it stands, I would argue the Second World War divided our pioneering era from our modern era. Presumably then, the changes and the continuities of the war years might have implications for the development of modern British Columbia. Potentially, our current understanding of this province then is built on flawed or incomplete foundations. In my readings through the literature, I also found out that there are a number of really good new and, and sometimes quite recent studies out there that show us glimpses into the ways that the conflict and its pressures were shaping British Columbians' lives. One of the most exciting is the posthumously published recent book on BC political history by Bob MacDonald, A Long Way to Paradise. He focuses less on individuals, parties, and class than traditionally has been the case in Canadian polit or BC political history. Uh, BC's blood sport. Instead, he explores more the ideologies and the collective political culture of British Columbians. And his examination of the 1941 to 45 period is really quite insightful. Uh, he notes that in the wartime atmosphere, partisan tensions eased sufficiently that collaboration across party lines was facilitated. And in that context, in his words, the mid-year war years appear to have been the point at which all parties accepted some measure of progressive social reform as a normative part of political discourse. He goes on to argue, it was during the war that the modernist embrace of specialized expertise, bureaucratic management structures, and welfare state reforms emerged as a transformative force in British Columbia's political culture. Now, before this book, scholars had assumed this kind of transition came much later, ideologically, as late as the 1960s. McDonald backdates this into the war years and showcases that BC was, in fact, ahead of other parts of the country in embracing this modernist ethos, which in many ways came to define government social structures and interaction in the second half of the 20th century in Canada. And it is this, I think, which makes Bob's conclusions about the war years so crucial. He integrates them and their impacts into the broader narrative of British Columbia, not only showing its place in the grand scheme of things, but also providing a plausible rationale for the war being a transition point in BC's 20th century history. On issues of women's experiences during the war, we might also extrapolate from the national story that it was transformative in the world of work especially and assume that women's place in the workplace after the war was significantly expanded. 
But work done on this topic by Eric Sager reveals that, in his words, the direct employment effects of the Second World War were short-term. A growth of jobs and industries in which women were traditionally employed, food products and laundries, and a small reduction in labor market segregation as jobs for women opened up in non-traditional se sectors, shipbuilding, metal trades, wood products, and miscellaneous industries. Overall, however, his suge study suggests that the war did see a boost in the number of working women, but he argues that the war's impact was, if anything, more disruptive than transformative. In Sager's opinion, the rise of women's labor force participation in the post-war decades, important as it was, should not distract attention from the early steady rise in women's labor force participation rates. Thus, in this instance, the war is more a blip in what was already a persistent trend to higher women's labor participation that was underway in the 1920s and 30s and 40s. Another important study by Lisa Pizzoli on working women and access to childcare, DC social policy, pays particular attention to the Second World War in part because it witnessed the first creation of state-sponsored childcare systems in Ontario and Quebec to enable mothers to join the workforce. His only notes, however, that the relative lack of, of diverse industrial and uh, wartime industries in BC, which distinguishes us from this, the experience in central Canada, undermined efforts to replicate those state-sponsored daycares here. While some privately established daycares did emerge, they were based primarily on the charitable grounds of need, rather than on the social rights of working mothers to have safe childcare. And these disappeared entirely at the end of the war. One final topic, just to point out a pair of other works that opened up the intertwined trends that we often associate more with modern post-1945 BC, urbanization and the rise of consumer society. Jill Wade's work on social housing highlights the degree to which our current shortage of affordable housing, especially in Vancouver, is really not a new thing. In the context of the Second World War, this was amplified by high in-migration into BC, particularly the Lower Mainland from other parts of Canada. In fact, during the Second World War, 163,000 interprovincial migrants came to British Columbia, bringing BC's population from 800,000 to nearly a million by war's end. And the city was already desperately short of housing when the war broke out because housing production had stalled during the Great Depression that had preceded the war. And so the result was a major crisis in Vancouver, especially that was not eased at least for the middle classes, until early in the 1950s, many years after the war. Michael Dawson's work explores one of the province's most important industries, tourism. Before his work came out, the assumption was that tourism all but disappeared during the Depression and the war years. But Dawson explores the continuities that continued in these years. For example, in 1941, over 450,000 Americans crossed the border into BC, many of them tourists. And some British Columbians also continue to travel and to play tourists, at least locally, throughout the war, in part due to high wartime salaries and disposable incomes available. And British Columbian salaries uh, were, in fact, on average, the highest in the country. Thus, this was part of a broader developing consumer culture that we see coming not just in BC, but in fact, across Canada. Uh, something we often assume came with 1950s suburbia and the Leave it to Beaver period, uh, but in fact should be dated properly to the war years. Now, I could go on here to talk about the expansion of labor unions and the favorable conditions of wartime, uh, something that's generated a quite sizable literature, in fact. It's one of the most ably explored topics in, in BC's Second World War experience. And on a range of other topics that um, have not had the same kind of treatment, there are revealing occasional fragments that can be gleaned. But I think the point I'm trying to make here is clear, that the war, in fact, was an important period in our history for the province and its development and for the people who lived through it, that it deserves to be explored and its stories integrated into our current understanding of how our contemporary BC came to be. So where do we go from here? Well, I'm in the early stages of a research project exploring BC in the Second World War. I just received a major research grant to pursue this work over the next four to five years, and 
I have at present is scheduled to conduct research in about 35 community and other archival collections in every corner of the province, in addition to the major governmental archival collections in Victoria and Ottawa and elsewhere. A big part of this effort will be to collect as many local histories as I can find, uh, either from local community archives and museums uh, or from community and, and popular local histories. Even though these can sometimes be challenging to find, you're more likely to, to find those, I think, often in a used bookstore than you are in a university library, for instance. I'm focusing my project in the role in particular that community played in mediating British Columbians' engagement with and experience of the war. Robert Rutherdale produced a great book exploring this and how this worked in the Great War, drawing on the experience of Lethbridge, Guelph, and Trois-Rivières. And he argued that essentially Canadians experienced the war, a distant phenomenon, within the confines of their own communities, what he termed hometown horizons. It's a, it's a lovely turn of phrase, I think. And I think it's a really compelling way to understand the home front experience of people far removed from, in fact, the fighting front. But I want to stretch the notion of community into a more multi-purpose tool for my project not only exploring municipalities, but also larger regional and even provincial communities, as well as more finite sub-municipal communities that developed around a voluntary organization, a regiment, a union hall, a school, a church, an ethnicity, or a gender. People find community in many places and forms and often are part and parcel of different communities. I believe that by examining the building blocks in that detail and in that diversity, when it comes time then to build those all back together, they will offer insights into the broader British Columbian experience of the Second World War. So, for example, the existing narrative we have of the Second World War in this province tends to focus on the post-Pearl Harbor years of the war and to ignore largely the 1939 to December 1941, the initial two years of the war, when the war was only in Europe and the Atlantic. Now, certainly British Columbians shared in the broader national sense that the war, like capital T, capital H, capital E, the war, was in Europe and the Atlantic. Most Canadians, in fact, looked east and barely considered the Pacific War as something that involved our country at all. The literature on BC, however, prioritizes the years after Japan entered the war when the threat of an attack brought the war home along the coast. As Patricia Roy and John Heard Thompson argue in their synthesis, British Columbians' war started in earnest with Japan's surprise attack on Pearl Harbor and the onset of the Pacific War. But I wonder, was this really the case? Or did British Columbians actually really begin to engage in the war earlier on? in September of 1939, right with the declaration, perhaps in January 1940, when the first Canadian troops arrived in Britain, or more likely in the summer of 1940, after France fell and Canada found itself Britain's next ranking ally. I wonder about this. Not only that, but we tend to focus on the Pacific experience. And, and so there's a real coastal bias, I think, in doing so. But I wonder to what degree did interior communities share the engagement with the Pacific War that was so immediate and, and ever present for coastal folks? Did the relative lesser proximity of the Pacific for residents in, say, Cranbrook, Penticton, Williams Lake, or Smithers also shift their focus to the Pacific after December the 7th, 1941? Or were they still more engaged in the European theater, the whole war? where their young men and women would be serving and dying. Perhaps it was only the sense of vulnerability that shifted coastal British Columbians' focus from looking east to looking west off to the Pacific. But I wonder, did Pacific British Columbians' focus remain on the Pacific after the Battle of Midway in 1942, once the tide turned and the, the threat to the coast receded? Or did coastal British Columbians again turn their attention back to European battlefields 
this is just one of the sort of interesting questions that I want to and have begun to explore. But I think it gives you an indication of how much still we need to know, how many, how many things are still largely undiscovered. Anyway, to conclude, there is one thing that I think I want each of you to take away from my talk today. I hope it's that each of you will note in the future when you encounter stories of the warriors in your own communities, and that you will include them in the stories that we share with our fellow British Columbians uh, as we try and help them to better know our collective society and its past. Thank you very much. <laughs>